David said to Saul, Let no man's courage fail him. Your servant will go fight that Philistine. But David, or but Saul said to David, You cannot go to that Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, for he's been a warrior from his youth. David said to Saul, Your servant has been tending his father's sheep. If a lion or a bear came and carried off an animal from the flock, I would go after it and fight it and rescue it from its mouth. And if it attacked me, I would seize it by the beard and strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. That uncircumcised Philistine shall end up like one of them, for he has defiled the ranks of the living God. The Lord, David went on, who saved me from lion and bear will also save me from that Philistine. Then go, Saul said to David, and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David in his own garment. He placed a bronze helmet on his head and fastened a breastplate on him. David girded his sword over his garment. Then he tried to walk, but he wasn't used to it. And David said to Saul, I can't walk in these, for I'm not used to them. So David took them off. He took his stick, picked up a few smooth stones from the wadi, and put them in the pocket of his shepherd's bag. And sling in hand, he went toward the Philistine. The Philistine, meanwhile, was coming closer to David, preceded by his shield bearer. When the Philistine caught, uh, caught sight of David, he scorned him, for he was but a boy, ruddy and handsome. And the Philistine called out to David, Am I a dog that you would come against me with sticks? The Philistine cursed David by his gods. And Philistine said to David, Come here, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and to the beasts of the field. David replied to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the ranks of Israel, whom you have defiled. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I will kill you and cut off your head, and I will give the carcasses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth. All the earth shall know that there is a God in Israel. And this whole assembly shall know that the Lord can give victory without sword or spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will deliver you into our hands. When the, day, when the Philistine began to advance toward him again, David quickly ran up to the battle line and faced the Philistine. David put his hand into his bag. He took out a stone and slung it. It struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord lives forever. And this is the word of the Lord. All well, thanks be to God. Now you, re you may remember from last week that God looks at the heart. A famous passage, or famous mention in the passage last week. God looks within the heart, not at outward appearance, as we typically do, and as Linda just mentioned in the children's moment. And um, th that picture that you see, we can see the outward appearance of that guy and kind of get an idea of what's going on in his heart. It is a is an angry guy there. And you know where that um, that picture comes from is from a recent article in the BBC um, asking from across the pond, why are Americans so angry? Uh, this week, I saw something on TV, and uh, something that was kind of coming from a, a book that a Yale professor wrote. It was about America's rage addiction, as he called it. Because of how divided are we, are, we are these days, because of how much rage we harbor in our hearts towards each other these days, whether it be political rage, road rage, you know, whatever. It shows up in all forms. We seem extraordinarily divided these days. And we are quick to jump on opportunities to go off about this or that. Um, political, economic, religious stuff, all the usual, plus more. But now we are more constantly and aggressively amped up 
to go and do something about it, to go and say something about it, to go off on somebody about it, to unleash that anger. Now, the idea of the book that this Yale professor is writing, uh, he's, he's comparing this rage uh, thing with addiction, talking, uh, speaking of it in terms of addiction, like with drugs or gambling or whatever else. So like a cycle of these highs and lows that you get stuck in. Is this, you get this high from, from unleashing that pent-up anger because that sets off certain chemicals in the brain, but that high is brief and afterwards leaves you feeling lower than before, so you need another rage to get back up again. You know, it's just the classic addiction style and thinking, uh, cycle and thinking of it in terms of rage. Now, I never thought about anger in terms of addiction, and they, even the anger in our culture. I hadn't thought about it in terms of, addip, of addiction. But there's definitely no question that there's a lot of anger in our culture right now. And, the, and this book is focused on Americans raging, and, um, falling into this anger and division, uh, even though all this same kind of stuff is going on in a lot of places around this world, this whole liberal, conservative, head-to-head -head thing we got going all over the place. Um, not only do we have big social issues of the day, as there always have been, as long as people have lived together in societies, but now we also have stuff like social media, television, radio, podcasts, anything else online. Um, many thought that, you know, with these advances in technology, we'd come together more from across the world and bind together um, more and become more as one. And while some of that has happened, we've also used these technologies um, increasingly uh, just to find more like-minded people like us to tribe up with and more opposite-minded people to go after and be mad about. Uh, these technologies are not the source of our problem, um, but they definitely help us instigate our problems if we let them. Not to take away from the many benefits of this stuff, but the pitfalls are proving very serious. Uh, just social media by itself has been very obviously linked up with the rise in teenage suicide and the rise in our political and divisiveness and other divisiveness. Uh, there's a clear connection between the, the rise in technology and how we've used it and how we are today. Um, you know, truth be told, there's a lot to be upset about in the world, like legitimate stuff to be upset about. Never mind all that fake news stuff, liberal side, liberal and conservative alike. You know, this is not a to say one does it and the other is innocent because it's not like that. Both sides are, are pushing a lot of fake stuff. Um, people pushing wild conspiracy theories or just blatantly making things up just to get attention. Now beyond that, there is an awful lot of stuff to actually be angry about. Bring all that in this situation together with our uh, increased ability to communicate with each other, with anywhere, any, anyone anywhere within the world and we find ourselves responding to our problems with the legitimate stuff to be upset about that in response to those we just blame each other on this more and more massive scale. You know, who better to take out your frustrations on than whoever you're talking to at the time, right? They didn't have all our modern technology when King David was growing up. Now they certainly still had their issues though. And they still had plenty of anger and fear and all this stuff to go around. Now in the moment that we enter today's reading in 1 Samuel, the Israelites were mad about those meanie-faced Philistines. That big guy Goliath was the figurehead of their problems. Standing tall like a giant, even bigger than King Saul, was, who, was, who was a big guy himself. As King Saul's limelight was fading with the little shepherd boy rising up, to take his place as king. Goliath was the figurehead of the imposing military force of the Philistines. And if they could only take down this giant, then they could take down the Philistines. Not only were they losing to the Philistines, this opposing military force with this giant, but they felt like they were being defiled because they were losing to these people who worshipped other gods. Their great King Saul, who proved victorious multiple times already against other enemies, now he was not proving victorious. Now he was failing and people were getting more and more upset about it. The Israelites were stuck between a rock and a hard place. They didn't have anybody who could go take down Goliath, or so they thought. 
They were fearful. They were frustrated. They were angry. David's father sent him to the front lines in the middle of all this commotion so David could go deliver some provisions to his brothers and to other troops. Not to fight, just to deliver provisions. David's still just a boy. He finds his brothers there and other soldiers uh, being confronted by Goliath again at the moment and actually being run off by Goliath, retreating for safety. Uh, and right away, um, David starts asking, like, well, what's the reward for taking down this Goliath guy? What's the deal with this? And Eliab, wanted to hear nothing of it. Eliab gets so mad, David's oldest brother, Eliab. He turns to, with his built-up anger and frustration and turns toward David. Why did you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your impudence and your impertinence. You came down here to watch the fighting. Now just imagine how much more mean Eliab might have sounded if he had said that on Facebook or Twitter. Now, if you're familiar with, uh, with people who, how people behave from behind the veil of the internet, you know, it gets really ugly really quick. Eliab might have thrown around some more foul language and more hurtful insults. Um, but even how it was, without all the technology, Eliab was still being pretty nasty toward David. And in response to Eliab, David showed his good heart. Being confronted by this, this anger, this rage, and David showed his good heart, and which is why God liked him and chose him to be the next king. David was able to take an insult in stride and to stay focused on what the real problem was instead of being dragged down into a pointless, raging argument with Eliab. Still a boy, by the way. Uh, anybody, but especially an adolescent kid, managing to stay above a petty argument that's pretty impressive in my book. David was just like, what have I done now? I'm only asking. And then he moved on. He asked a few others around and he got the same angry, condescending kinds of responses. Word got around to King Saul that David was asking. Now, while David had begun his rise to power, David um, had, it wasn't becoming known to Saul yet. King Saul didn't realize it. So David was still in Saul's good graces, being the one who could play music for Saul because Saul was being infiltrated by, by evil spirits at this time. He liked David a lot. So he was interested in hearing what David had to say. Initially, Saul had his doubts big time about fighting Goliath. You can't go fight that guy. You're just a boy. But David was able to talk him into it. David was very confident. His heart was full of courage. Courage not only in his own abilities, but also courage in his faith. Courage in God having his back. Courage in his own abilities because he had protected his family sheep from lions and bears. He had killed lions and bears protecting sheep. Yeah, he's a tough kid. But beyond that, his faith in God was unbreakable. He believed in his heart that if he was genuinely committed to God, that God would have his back. He got the approval with the king. He had his courage to stand up against Goliath. With faith, he held a sling and stones. And with power, he took down that giant, freeing his people from their enemies. So we've got our own giants to face today. Giants stand before us in the real problems we're facing as people in the world. Real problems we could go on and on about. COVID, cancer, corruption, political, economic, and religious conflicts. The damage we're doing to this planet. Our fears and frustrations over whoever we call our enemies. The anger we harbor in our hearts, even toward one another. Our infighting, just aggravating our problems instead of addressing them escalating our rage toward each other instead of using our advances in communication to, I don't know, communicate. Whether or not this rage culture should be viewed in terms of an addiction, I think is a fascinating idea, uh, something to consider. Now, I, I can't say uh, whether it is that or not. It's, that's not my place to say. Um, but seeing it in that way may help us address some of this anger that we're dealing with, address some of this anger going on in a lot of our own hearts. 
Well, so while it's not for me to decide whether or not this rage thing is, is an addiction, as uh, the good argument is making, what I am here for is to lift up before you the good and courageous heart of young King David taking on the giants in his life. And likewise to lift up before you early Christians as we found in 2 Corinthians today with courageous hearts taking on the giants in their lives. Showing great endurance in the face of afflictions and hardships, calamities and beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. They had giants to deal with. And while it may be tempting sometimes to shoot somebody in the face with a slingshot, it's clear throughout the New Testament what it means for us Christians to have good and courageous hearts like King David. We dedicate ourselves to purity, to knowledge, to patience and kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech. And in stuff like that, we find the power of God. We find our weapons, we find that our weapons are weapons of righteousness, not weapons of war. Weapons of, of truth, joy, being rich in spirit, with the heart wide open to the love and the grace of God. And Lord knows it takes a lot of courage to show these characteristics when you're facing a giant. In 2 Corinthians it says, open, uh, it, it says, our heart is open wide to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. I speak to you as children, open wide your hearts also. So people of God, let us open wide our hearts to the Lord and that strength and courage and wisdom and everything God has to provide for us. And let, uh, let us find our courage to open wide our hearts to God and to God's ways. Let us find our courage to look within, to, to understand ourselves better and, and to, to, to push out any of that anger and fear and stuff that we're dealing with and replace it with this courage and this faith and this love and this life that God provides. May we carry forward as God's faithful. And as God takes a look into our hearts, May God find hearts not full of rage, not full of fear, not full of any of that stuff. But may God find our hearts full of love, full of the love that Jesus showed us on the cross. And may that love spill over to bless all of creation.